perspectives, they will get us faster and faster and faster. It's our moment for learning, it's our moment for improvement, and it's one of the key tenets of Agile itself. So I thought it'd be worth just discussing what it is, this Agile thing that we're doing, notably what retrospectives are about, and how can we do them better? consultancy approach to talk to each other. So what, why, who, and when. So what is it? It's not a white hole. It's a chance actually to step back and reflect. It's supposed to be a safe harbor, a place that everyone can feel confident in themselves to be able to bring what they managed to do, the increments of things that they did, and a place where they can constructively criticize both the stuff that they did and what others did in a hope that if we were to have done this again, here's how we could have done it better. Does anyone disagree with that definition? Cool. So at least we're in agreement about what it should be. But actually it's more about being a barometer. I mean, you can use it to judge the health of your team. You can see the communication, what's worked well and what hasn't, the transparency, the efficiency of the team which is often not the same as the effectiveness. And also how reactive you were to things that went wrong and things that could have been better. And did you have to wait till the end of the two weeks in order to actually make a change? Or how, how much were you disrupted by external factors? Interestingly, it's not just a tool for people within the team, but can also be used externally. Take HR, for example. I'm sure everyone has been to a review where they've seen their performance measured by how much they did. But there's not much often I see where HR uses this to see how much you helped others or how much you participated inside of a retrospective. For example, how much did you help someone else be better? Because actually, you helping others is more important than you helping yourselves, especially when you work in business. I would argue that the purpose of a retrospective is to foster a desire for improvement. It's there to create this culture of introspection, that time where you get to sit back and reflect. It should increase the empowerment of the people in the room, and it should reduce the frustration going forward. Because if it's not doing that, what is it doing? And if you agree that it should be doing that, is that happening in your teams? The last retrospective you had, how many of the frustrations that people had in the room were actually resolved going forward? And if not, why not? Because these aren't just for the Scrum and Agile teams. Retrospectives can be applied to just about anything that has an increment where you can reflect and say, if we had our time again, what would we have done differently? They're useful for any team that has a degree of autonomy and controlling their own processes. So 
I agree that if you're a supermarket checkout clerk, then probably a retrospective isn't that useful to you. Unless you give the team autonomy, purpose, and mastery, and they can control those elements and say, hey, as a business, we're going to get you to be the best checkout clerks you can be, in which case then absolutely you should be doing these sorts of things. Now, whether you want to call it agile or not is up to you. But I would guess that most people in here fit inside of an agile team, and therefore you're already doing retrospectives. But figure out how this fits into the concept of high-performing teams. Has anyone heard of uh, high-performing teams? So it sounds like the other three is mastery, autonomy, and purpose. And this absolutely fits under the autonomy of how you should be improving your own purpose. One of the most common questions I get asked about is, well, how long should my retrospective last? And how often should I do it? And my, my answer is I don't care. But it doesn't really matter. If you need them to be longer, you'll make them longer. And there is no set rule. What does matter is that you do them regularly and then you don't miss them. I mean, how many people have been so busy and so worked up that they need to get a release out that the thing they dropped was the retrospective? That's the time that you don't. That's where things have gone wrong. This is when you need more than ever to fix things. And the last thing in the world you need to do is to stop it. But there's rules as well. Um, there's not actually that many rules. In fact, I only have one. There's only one thing I care about. And actually, it's non curve There's a few versions of this in iterations, but I like Nolds personally. Because it says, regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, and resources available, and the situation at hand. This absolves people from attacking personally. This means that I, I believe, Jack, you did a good job. Jane, I'm not saying it's your fault. What I'm saying is you need to understand what happened. And I'm not saying that you did the wrong thing. I'm just saying that we should have made a better choice, perhaps. But we should at least discuss it. This is not about applying blame. This is about improving. Uh, if you want to read more about this, then there's blameless postmortems. Go and read up on them. There's tons of stuff on, uh, on Google. So the next thing that you can get wrong quite easily is the scope of a retrospective. So it's, it's, it's quite obvious what you should include inside of a retrospective, except what it's not. Because you shouldn't be dwelling on things that you can't change and you can't improve. And that's really annoying to us humans. Uh, if you take the political side of it, my Facebook feed is full of people ranting around Trump. Absolutely full. But it's not something we can change and we can't improve it. However, we love to rant about it because we've got an opinion and we care. And that's fine and we care. But if we're going to take that same effect and start ranting about the CEO um, or talking about a budget that's too tight, if we can't change it or improve it, <coughs> all we're doing is wasting time trying to discuss something that is not going to improve. Great, it's cathartic, but a retrospective isn't the place for it. You want to take that offline and deal with that some other way if you can. <coughs> the focus should be the increments. That's kind of obvious, the thing that you've just done. The code, the features, but also the process itself. You might have gone through a DR failover, for example, which isn't a process you've done in a while, and actually looking at the DR <coughs> failover process is as important as looking at the actions that you took during the DR itself. Also, there's external factors, distractions that have come in, things that hit the fan that you may not have planned for. And this is a good time to be able to talk about how you could have been better by not having been as distracted as much. Perhaps introduce Pomodoro, which means that for 25 minutes, you can't be distracted. Maybe that doesn't work for you. But you, it's a place in which you can bring that to the front and everyone can discuss about what they think would make it better. And then try it. Remember that change in order to take effect must be positive. People generally don't go for negative change unless they're narcissistic. And we generally, often we don't actually work with people who are positively narcissistic. And so, positive questions positively. What went well?
well? What could we do better? What was useful? What could be more useful? How can we improve rather than, you know that thing over there, it was shit, wasn't it? Yeah, we all agree it was shit, great. <laughs> what else do we think was shit? <laughs> all right, we have a lot of shit. At, okay, well, <laughs> rather than talking about the fact we don't have backups or we don't test them, how can we test our backups? <laughs> so, since we're talking about shit, I can see you know which approach this carefully laid plan could ever fail. So, everyone following any project plan ever. So, there are some things that you can really do to hurt the value you get from your retrospectives. Notably, dominating personalities. Me. I can be really, really detrimental to retrospectives if I'm not careful. Because A, I'm really opinionated, which is partly why I'm still up here. I'm particularly senior, so of course I can do everyone's job. <laughs> also, I've got a lot of experience. So I've been there, done that, and actually I'm coloured and biased because of it. And so I can railroad anyone down a particular path if I so choose. Even worse, if I didn't choose to do it. So be aware of yourself in the room. And be careful about how quickly you dismiss the opinion of someone else. To pick on the favourite topic of the day, I support Trump. Yeah, go away. Or maybe for a second, just a second, I should try and figure out why that person held that belief in the first place. Why could they possibly be right? Could I possibly be wrong? Unconscious bias is everywhere. And even worse, is thinking you don't have an unconscious bias when you do. Because you need to fairly consider everything that's brought to the table. In fact, the junior that stands up and says, hey, why aren't we doing two week sprints? Why are we just doing one week sprints? The answer is, and that's not the way we do things around here. Agile isn't about tradition. It's opposite, it's about breaking tradition. And assume that every suggestion is valid. If you can't argue for the suggestion that's been made for 10 seconds, just in your head, then you probably don't understand it well enough, and that's something you should try and address. Okay, maybe it's still a crazy idea, but at least then you understand where that idea came from. If nothing else, it'll help you understand the perspective better and increase your levels of empathy. Finally, watch out for the exclusive formats. I've seen things happen the same over, same over, same over, same. If all you're getting is the same inputs, expecting different outputs is going to be insanity. Don't get stuck into a routine where one person speaks, the next person speaks, the next person speaks, and then we go home. The whole point about this is that we get different views and different uh, inputs into what could have gone, what did go wrong and what could have gone better. And not everyone interacts in the same way. I don't know how many people here have got stuck in the routine uh, you write what you know on a, or want to say on a post-it note, and you have to stand up and walk in front of everyone and claim it on the wall. Not everyone wants to do that, especially if the topic's sensitive, especially if the person isn't extroverted. So make sure you've got different ways of getting that feedback. You can rush them. I mean, you can really undermine the importance of retrospectives. I mentioned earlier, you could just skip them because you're busy. Or worse, you could have just a few people turn up. Oh, even worse, you could have it so that people turn up and don't participate. <coughs> be it on your phone, be it on your laptop, not actively being in the room. It devalues the purpose of what you're doing there. And that then means that people ignore the output, which means that it's a big waste of time because people aren't bought in. So those that run it really need to underscore the importance of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and why everything else can wait, just for half an hour. Ultimately, if you're not getting much out of it, often that means you're not putting the right things into it. Perhaps you're not putting enough into it. And if you are, have a good look at what's going wrong. Because you should be upset 
So, a tale from sales, which is, if one of our sales people go off, the worst thing you can do is say yes to their first offer. Because they think they've left money on the table. They could have asked for $10 more. Their value is driven by how much money they bring in for the thing that they sell. And yes, they're given targets and they're giving um, remuneration that fits in with the more money you bring in, the more money you get. But they get angry if they could have done better. So where's our value in our teams? It's not by doing our hours and filling our timesheets in. It's by about how productive, how effective, how, what we delivered. And if there's opportunity for us to have done better next week, we should be angry because we could have been better. We could have done better. So how could we do better? We could level up. Leadership is something that's sorely missing in a lot of IT teams. People focus on mastery and themselves. I talked before about how people are measured by how good you are the thing that you've delivered, how well you've done. But how, how have you helped others be better? <coughs> At my level, in my organization, I'm a multiplier. If I spend an hour doing something, I get an hour of stuff done, that's a waste of time for me. I should be doing an hour of things that help others get stuff done that would have taken 10 hours. <coughs> Not by being a leader. So, retrospectives, this is about making the person who's got the least to say speak first. All of our juniors talk first in the retrospectives so that they have a chance to learn. They're there in order to deliver the piece of information that they learned this week. That's great, it gives me insight into what they're doing, but it also gives other people insight into what they're saying. Then, you incrementally go through the until the person who's got the most experience speaks last. And I don't measure her by how much she speaks, I measure her by how little she has to. If I'm taking out the most senior person from the room, can the team run and function without her? Can the people in the middle, do they understand what's going on? Or is it all being driven by that one guy who knows everything and if they didn't turn up for work tomorrow, it's screwed. Watch out for diversity, because diversity isn't just about the usual gender, race, and religion stereotypes. It's about diversity of thought and experience. You want diversity of roles inside of your retrospectives? If all you've got are the de developers, and you've had some database issues, and you haven't got anyone who understands the databases instilled in your team, then you're gonna struggle to get the right you coming out. You're also going to struggle if all you've got is senior engineers. I've seen some really poorly performing teams that are full of people who've been doing their job for 20 years and all think they know everything. A bunch of alphas that are great, you know the rock star IT, fine. How are you helping any of the team in your organization? How are you helping anyone level up other than by existing and doing the work for them? I refer you back to the leadership quote. Diversity, if you're not seeing the benefits of diversity, then you don't have a team that's diverse enough and you're not looking at it right. Every single study that has come out over the past 30 years underscores it. This, I think, is one of the most important points because this goes back to the tradition. Break the boundaries and keep it different. You should be uncomfortable and feel like every sweat you go through, you're not going through the motions. You should be breaking new ground each time. You shouldn't feel like we're just going through and delivering. You're not building a house. You're designing a better house and a better house. And if you're not doing something new, you're likely going to be feeling comfortable. I talk about it in these terms and I get a lot of blank looks as to what on earth are you talking about. Well, let me tell you in a different way. We've all had relationships where we looked at ourselves in the mirror one morning and realized six months ago, I should have left. 
And the reason that I've not is because it's safe, it's comfortable, I'm happy here. And the reason I don't take something else is because it's scary. And the moment that scary is different is the moment you don't go for the difference. The moment that scary is change, you don't change. And if you're not changing, why are you even looking at yourself to challenge yourself on how you could have changed? Because failing is okay. And if you stop failing, you forget how to fail. And the fear of failing builds up again. So failing actually helps you. And so just make sure that the failures are small and they have little impact on you. But failing means you change. So what are you changing? And what are you doing next? Because if, if you're always working and it doesn't ever fail, you become fearful the time it does. We know this with disaster recovery, which is why we run disaster recovery drills. But quite often we don't look at how much we've changed over the past year to see if we're just doing the same thing. And teams that are doing this well, teams that are doing this right, they are changing and they are improving. So by what you think you're doing is staying still and static and doing well, you're falling behind and that's different because this is a race. Hold retrospectives on your retrospectives. How often do you sit there and say, just for five minutes at the end of your 30 minute retrospective, so what did we miss? What could we have done? How could this have been better? I mean, this is a picture from an inception. If anyone can get it, yes, it does go all the way down. But actually, just at one level, challenge yourself on whether you are actually in the great place you think you are. So Voltaire, there's a famous quote from Voltaire, which says that perfection is the enemy of good. And I have to disagree, because when you settle for good, it means you stop trying to be perfect. You can always be better. And so you should always strive to be better and to, do, to have done better. But it's okay that you're not. I mean, it's fine to accept that we did what we could. In fact, go back to the non-code. We could only have got as far as we had <coughs> because we didn't know then what we know now. But we do know now. And we're about to do another cycle of stuff that's probably really similar, because that's the way it works. So how can we do it better? So that's my question to you. How can your next sprint be better? <coughs> logging into the virtual conference rather than going to a meeting room, for example. And those remote first ones tend to have it linked. They're the ones that focus on communication first and how you deal with swarming an issue. Um, is that you get a room in an office and the people remotely, well, they'll either jump on a train or you have an input phone, but they're definitely distant from it. Or do you set up a Slack room? and you set up a wiki page that starts to count things and do you have something do you have everything set up that someone else somewhere else could do it and if you operate in a remote friendly environment you have challenges you also have challenges culturally because people seem to think that uh, working from home on a friday means you're having an easy day <laughs> whereas remote first organizations actually the people who work from home are more productive <coughs> they have less distractions and 
uh, for some people, very even distanced over different offices in different cities, or yeah. even over in different time zones. And how you deal with having a meeting with remote people is how you address that, rather than talking about retrospectives specifically. Okay. But retrospectives are a great meeting to highlight the issues you have of not having good communication inside your organization in general. And that's what you need to fix, rather than just how do I have Jack sat there and, uh, on an iPad pretending he's here? Or how do I get Jane actually logged in? And uh, so the, the key thing with that is audio. If someone can hear everything that goes on in the room and can follow who is talking about what, 90% of the other problems have gone away. But so often, I've been on a remote call and it's like, I can hear one person really loudly and another person really quietly and I'm a second class citizen dialing in. But break that <coughs> mentality that the people in the room are responsible for letting me hear it, rather than it's my responsibility and tough luck you're not here. And so you'll have to suck it up and deal with it. If you change that mentality, then usually that helps. And keep throwing it out to the person. I want your opinion, people on the phone. If you can't hear us, then we'll stop and fix that problem. Not that you're fixing the wrong problem. Okay, just time for one more question. Anybody else got a question for Dan? Yep, go on. Um, so um, I'm not a developer, um, but I'm, I'm a manager, I guess, and I'm just interested from thinking about um, the rest of the teams in your organisation and not necessarily the agile teams and sprints and stuff. Do you have a do you have another another a different approach to retrospectives for non technical teams or actually are you following pretty much the same principles? It's exactly the same principles. The problem that I find when talking to organisations of this nature, especially business teams and people who think they're different, talking to CEOs and board meetings and how do I that if they're not doing retrospectives, I'm pretty certain they are. They call them different things, though. Mm -hmm. They'll call them an offsite, or they might call them a quarterly review, or what they're doing exactly the same, but what they're forgetting to do is to review the thing that they're reviewing. And the principles get thrown away because they throw it all away with the word agile. Mm -hmm. And agile is so much more than just Scrum and Kanban or, or Waterfall or any other token. So I would, I would watch the terminology being used and talk about the benefits that come out of it and just suggest, hey, that time that you take a look at the thing that you've done over the past three months or whatever it is, perhaps we should apply these principles to it. Perhaps we put some post-it notes on the wall. Uh, perhaps we should talk in this circle. Or perhaps we should get the person who's got the least to speak first. And mm. You can apply all the same methodology and at the end of the day they don't even know what they're doing. Okay, great, Dan, thank you.